Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our session. Uh, Seeger V2 is coming soon to a cluster near you. Thank you for coming after lunch. Uh, my name is David Porter. I'm from Google. I uh, work on the GK uh, node team, and I work in upstream SIGnode. Uh, this is Mrinal Patel. Uh, hey, folks. I'm Mrinal Patel. I work for Red Hat. Uh, so I work on container runtimes. I'm a maintainer of uh, OCI runtime spec, RunC, Cryo, and I also work on SIGnode upstream. So uh, first off, we're going to talk about resource management. What is resource management really in terms of Kubernetes? So here's a 10,000 view, uh, 10,000 feet overview of resource management, right? Clusters consist of nodes, and nodes have resources, like CPUs, memory, disks, GPUs. And uh, resource management is about management, managing these resources. So, Nodes advertise the availability to the Kubernetes scheduler. So typically, you have some amount of memory on your node, say 32 GB. You want to reserve some for your system, like the kernel and the, and the processes that are there on the node running natively as system services. Then you want to reserve some for the kubelet in your container runtime. Say you take away 4 GB each, you have 24 remaining, and that's what's advertised to the scheduler as allocatable. So here's an example of a pod that has resources set. It has requests and limits. So the scheduler is looking at requests when it is scheduling pods on nodes. So when it finds a node uh, that's able to satisfy the request, it, it schedules a pod on that node. And limit is what a pod cannot exceed. So what are some of the requirements uh, from resource management. So pods should not be able to hurt each other, right? They should stay within the limits. They should get uh, consistent performance based on what they requested. Uh, we should be able to prevent uh, infinite loops, fork bombs, memory leaks, node lockups. And we should allocate the right amount of resources for pods. And also we want to ensure that doing all this management doesn't utilize a lot of resources. Ultimately, we want to allow as many pods uh, to be run on a node as possible, right? You don't want to have a lot of overhead from the system components. So how do we do this? So we do this with something called a C groups in the Linux kernel. It's, it's a way to group a set of processes hierarchically, hierarchically, and then you have a set of controllers that allow you to put limits on those processes. So we have the CPU, um, memory, IOs, these are some of the controllers that can be used to put limits on the processes. And uh, C groups are controlled through a pseudo file system, which is called a C group FS. So basically, you write to these files to set limits. And then there are other files that you read to monitor and get statistics back on what, how much memory it's using, how many processes are running, and so on. So here's a history of uh, C groups. So the first version of C groups was introduced by Google in the Linux kernel in 2006. It was first called as process controllers. It didn't cover uh, everything. Then slowly over time, a lot of different folks came and contributed other controllers. Uh, then uh, in V2, development started in 2016. Some of the goals of V2 was try to simplify things. Like things were added organically. Right? As, and so the controllers weren't working well with each other, and they were not unified. So V2 is an attempt to simplify things and also provide more features and more stability. So Fedora moved to V2 in 2019. Docker and RunC grew support for it in 2020. And in 2021, most of the distros are now enabling C groups V2 by default. Also, like V1 is considered legacy at this point, right? So kernel fixes in this area are mainly going to V2. Also, System D is planning to remove V1 support by end of 2023. So the big message here really is that V2 is real. It's coming. If you aren't already testing it, you should be planning to test out V2 to make sure it works well for you. And you can give us feedback to fix any issues uh, that you find. So here's an overview. Like it, basically, this slide shows that all the popular distributions that are used with Kubernetes today 
all the container runtimes, the higher level ones like container D, cryo, docker, the lower level ones like run C, C run, have support for C groups V2. And uh, in 125, we finally went GA with C groups V2. So Kubernetes supports it now. So what's new in V2, right? So the first thing is a single unified hierarchy. So I'll go over that in the next slide. Then there are some additional improvements. So I mentioned like how the controllers were added one after the other, right? So with V2, now work has been done so they can work well together. So one example is page cache writebacks, right? The memory and the IO controllers work together to properly account which processes are charged for that. Then on the memory side, like uh, user end memory, uh, TCP socket buffers, kernel memory such as inodes and dentries are tracked together under the memory uh, memory controls. Also on the memory side, we have way more knobs compared to before. So we have more control over when the kernel starts throttling your memory allocations instead of just like hitting a limit and getting oom killed. Then there's something uh, new called as pressure stall information. So it allows us to monitor how much resource pressure uh, is there in a particular C group for CPU, memory, or IO? And uh, finally, like this better delegation support. So this allows us to run rootless containers well. Like for example, Podman uses this uh, for its rootless support. So here's an example of V1 versus V2 hierarchy. So on the left, you see a C groups V1. And you can see like how the CPU and memory controllers are mounted separately under this FSC group. And then you have to go and add your process to each of them separately. So it, it, it's more flexible, but it's clunky, right? And in practice, most of the time you're gonna end up putting them under the same hierarchy. So on the right, you see that with V2, there is a single hierarchy of C groups. And then finally, all the settings for a particular C group are under a, under a single directory. So that's, uh, that's a unified hierarchy. I will uh, hand it off to David to cover some more details here. Thank you, Manal, for explaining some of the new features uh, in C group v2. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how Kubelet and Kubernetes actually makes use of C groups to provide resource management. So the important thing to understand here is there's actually two components that interface with C groups in the context of a node. Uh, it's the Kubelet and the container runtime. So the way it works is that Kubelet creates a C group for each pod. When you start a pod, uh, the Kubelet actually creates a C group to house all the containers within that pod. Uh, next, the container runtime will actually create a C group for each container. So the Kubelet actually passes the path of the C group for the pod to the container runtime, and the container runtime owns the C group within each pod. Uh, the other thing is that Kubelet actually manages not just the pod C groups, but the whole C group hierarchy with QoS classes. So Kubernetes is a concept of QoS class. There's burstable, best effort, and guaranteed pods, and there's in different levels of the C group hierarchy. So depending on the QoS class of the pod, the C group of the pod will be placed under that QoS top level uh, C group. So I want to talk a little bit about how do we actually set these C group values. How do they get from your pod spec into the, into the kernel and set in the C group FS? So it all starts with a, with a pod spec, right? You create your pod, the kubelet observes it, and it has some, some amount of requests and limits set. The next step is that kubelet will go ahead and create the pod C group. Then for the containers, it's going to actually talk to the CRI, the container runtime, uh, over the CRI protocol over gRPC. And the, CRI protocol actually has some definitions for all of these different values. So we start to convert these values from the pod spec into uh, the CRI kind of definition. The next step is that the CRI will actually be responsible to talk to the underlying container runtime. And sometimes it's the same component, sometimes it's a different kind of subcomponent. And it converts basically the CRI into the real container. So we create an OCI JSON specification. OCI is the container kind of standard. And inside the OCI uh, spec, there's this config.json file, which is the standard. And it has different fields for the resources. Uh, so it has explicit fields for the memory and, and CPU. And it actually also has a new unified field that was added for Cgroup v2 to add to set Cgroup v2 properties. So once we have the OCI JSON spec, the next step is to pass it to a lower level container runtime that can run OCI container images. Uh, so this is usually run C. This is kind of the standard. 
And depending on something called the system, the C group driver that's being used, and I'll go into a little bit about what that means. Uh, usually, if you're using C group v2, you should be using the system d C group driver. And what that means is that the OCI container runtime, run C here, will actually talk to system D on the machine to create something called a system D scope unit. So it will be managed by system D, and system D has understanding around all these properties around CPU and memory and other resource controls. Run C will also actually talk to the Linux kernel. So system D and run C will both talk to CGroupFS on the Linux kernel to finally set the actual values in, in the kernel and set each property uh, for, for the resource requirements. So that's how we get from the pod spec uh, to CGroupFS. So let's talk a little bit about what properties are actually set and, and what they do. So the main properties we have right now are CPU and memory. That's the main resources we kind of manage. So the first thing let's talk about is CPU requests. So when you set a CPU request, what are you actually doing? The first thing is that you're telling what the minimum amount of CPU your container needs. And so the scheduler will look at the CPU request, and before it schedules a pod to a node, it checks that that node has that CPU available. This gives you the guarantee that you will always get that CPU request. Even if the node is 100% busy, everything's using CPU, you'll always get the CPU request for it. The kubelet and the scheduler never overcommit on CPU. To actually implement a CPU, uh, we use something called CPU shares, which is a Linux kernel feature. It's called CPU shares in, in C group v1 and CPU.wait in C group v2, but the concept is the same. And the idea is it's a unit that we use, uh, and each container gets some amount of these CPU shares, which is kind of an arbitrary unit. And then the kernel, when it does actually CPU scheduling, it'll take a look and kind of sum up all the CPU shares in a given uh, C group hierarchy and understand the ratio of some amount of shares in one C group to another. And that ratio is how much CPU one C group will get compared to a different C group. So in this simple example here, we have kind of one CPU and we have three containers. You can think one has 1,024 shares, another two have 512. So the first one will get 50% of the CPU and the other two will get 25%. And if you had more CPUs, we would sum this across all the CPUs on the system. So that's CPU limits, or that's CPU uh, requests. Now let's talk about CPU limits. So CPU limits use something called CFS bandwidth control in the Linux kernel to actually be implemented. And unlike CPU requests, the scheduler actually completely ignores CPU limit when it does scheduling. So this is only used to be enforced uh, in C groups. So the way to think about CPU limits is they are the ceiling for CPU. You can never use more CPU than you put in the limit. In fact, if you use more CPU uh, than you put in your limit, you will be throttled uh, by the CFS bandwidth control in the kernel. And so the important thing to know here is you'll be throttled even if there's spare CPU cycles available. The way this works is that uh, there's, there's two concepts called CPU quota and CPU period. And in Seagrove v2, they're called CPU max, but the same properties apply. And the idea is you have a CPU period, and a period is a unit of time, usually the default, and the, the default everyone uses is 100 milliseconds, and then you have some amount of quota. And the way to think about it is you basically get that amount of quota, that amount of time that you can use for CPU in each wall clock kind of period. So you have a 100 millisecond period and you get some amount of quota. And you can use that amount of quota within 100 milliseconds. If you use up all the quota uh, within that first 100 milliseconds or before the 100 milliseconds are over, you get throttled. And then you need to wait until that 100 milliseconds expires. And then in the next kind of 100 milliseconds, you again can use that quota. So it's kind of this bursting bank where you constantly get refilled with quota. And at each, at each period, you have the ability to use that quota, and if you use more quota than you're allowed to, you'll get throttled. So that's the idea behind CPU limits. Uh, so with CPU limits, there's kind of been something I want to address, which is kind of what I call the CPU limits debate. So if you look online, there's kind of a debate going on. You'll see tweets like this that, for example, say, never set CPU limit. And then there's other tweets that say something like, you know, debate's raging. Should you set CPU limits, yes or no? Uh, there's articles say you should keep using CPU limits in Kubernetes, and then art other articles, for the love of God, stop using CPU limits. <laughs> so really confusing, and you might be asking yourself, all right, what is going on here? What should I be doing with CPU limits? So let me try to give you my take on it. So the first thing that we can kind of all agree that I don't think there's any kind of uh, any debate about is always setting a CPU request. So CPU requests are used for scheduling. You need to set a CPU request to uh, provide the minimum amount of CPU you need. And if you don't set it, you'll, get, you'll become a best effort pod QoS, and you will basically not be guaranteed any amount of CPU. So always set a CPU request. That we can all agree on. Now, about CPU limits. So like all things, I can't give you a definitive answer. I think there's trade-offs here. So let me try to explain them. So the cons of CPU limits is kind of the, the feature of CPU limits at the same point, which is that you can't use any spare CPU cycles. So if there's spare CPU cycles on the node, and you set a CPU limit and you hit that limit, 
you can't use that spare CPU available, right? And so this kind of translates that you're kind of throwing away unused CPU. You have CPU available, but your pods can't use it. And you know, if your pod is really bursty and suddenly gets more traffic or has more things it needs to do, it won't be able to use those spare CPU cycles. And so if you start to, to measure this and, and kind of and analyze it, you, and you start to graph it out, you might see that you might introduce some artificial throttling into your application, and, and especially your you know, P99 latency, for example, might increase. So that's kind of the cons, right? But the pros of setting CPU limits is that you're not actually relying on those spare CPU cycles. So if you're constantly relying on spare CPU cycles and you're constantly hitting the throttling limit, that probably means you set a low CPU request. And the problem with that is that those spare CPU cycles are unpredictable, right? There's no guarantee you get them. If there's other pods that are scheduled later that use up a lot of CPU, you will not be able to use that CPU that's available, right? Because somebody else is using it. So you're kind of relying uh, on this unpredictable CPU, right? And that's kind of the, the issue there. So if you do set a CPU limit, you'll kind of get more predictable behavior, right? You'll, get, you'll become in the guaranteed QoS tier, and you'll always ensure that you're not relying on this unpredictable CPU cycles that may not be there. The other scenario where it's useful is a multi-tenant environment. So if you have multiple teams, for example, scheduling pods on a node and you want to do some type of chargeback and ensure that one team can't use some amount of CPU, it's useful in that scenario as well. So that's kind of CPU. Um, memory is actually kind of simpler to understand. Uh, memory request, it's only used for scheduling. We don't actually set it at all in C groups. In V1, in V2 that will change, and I'll talk about that in a second. And for memory limit, uh, we kind of have two knobs, memory.max in C group V2 and memory max limited bytes in V1. And it's very simple. You set that, and it comes from your pod spec, from your container, right? If you go over that limit, you get um killed. Really simple. And so the recommendation that we have generally is set your memory requests equal to your limit. The reason for that is uh, with CPU, you can kind of overcommit on it, right? It's a compressible resource. But with memory, it's not compressible, right? You can't overcommit on memory. So the recommendation is to always set memory request equal limit. That way, uh, you don't impact other pods on the system, and you might be using more resources than you can request. So the other item that I kind of touched on earlier and I want to kind of explain a little bit more is about, about C group drivers. So this is kind of a little bit of a misunderstood concept, so I kind of want to talk about it a little bit. So as I mentioned earlier, there's two components that interact with C groups on the system, the kubelet and the container runtime. And the kubelet, right, owns the pod C group, and the container runtime owns the container C groups. And when you interface with the C group subsystem, there's actually two kind of APIs that you can interface with it. One is the C group FS, where you're just talking directly to the kernel and setting values. And the second option is something called the system D driver. And the system D driver basically means that instead of talking directly to the C group file system, you're first talking to system D. And system D has this concept of slices and scopes, which are kind of abstractions for C groups. And then uh, system D will actually go ahead and set the values in the, in the C group uh, FS kernel. And so with the C group V2, one of the requirements of C group V2 is that we only have kind of one process that manages C groups at any given level. And since system D kind of owns that responsibility, it's kind of the default baked in every distro, we really strongly recommend that you use the system D C group driver on both the kubelet and the container runtime when you're using C group V2. And this is something that you need to configure in kubelet and the container runtime. They have to match. And we really do recommend using that system D C group driver, as I mentioned. So the other item that we want to kind of talk about is monitoring. So C groups provide us resource management, right, resource throttling. Uh, but also, they provide us the ability to export metrics. And so the way this works is that uh, there's a project called the C Advisor. I'm the maintainer of it, actually. And C Advisor is responsible for actually scraping those metrics um, in C group FS and getting them to Kubelet. And then other systems will kind of actually get that information and export it out you know, to Prometheus. And, and that's how you can see them in all your kind of Grafana and other dashboards, et cetera, right? And so the way it actually works is Kubelet depends on C Advisor as a library. It links it in. And uh, C Advisor, we had to update it. We had to do some changes to ensure it works with C Group V2. That was done in V043 version, and it's included in kind of the latest, uh, you know, latest kubelets. Uh, there's also some other work I wanted to mention here where we're actually moving a lot of this metric collection away from C Advisor and into the container runtime. That'll ensure that we kind of can make it uh, uniform across different kind of container runtimes and not depend on C Advisor to get the stats. So that work is ongoing. So the other big effort is, is as part of graduating Sigur V2 to GA, one of the big things that we worked on is actually testing it and making sure it works well. And so SigNode has a whole bunch of kind of tests that we run against Kubelet and against the different ecosystem to make sure it works well. So as part of this, we wanted to ensure that all the features, everything works well with Sigur V2. So we actually added new test jobs in, in open source here uh, to basically test all the variants of different tests on Sigur V2. And you can see those highlighted here. So there's conformance, serial, node tests, cluster tests, all types of different tests that we ran. And we're running all these jobs continuously. We're running them actually against the latest container D as well. So we're getting coverage of both container D, run C, and the latest kind of kubelet. 
We also worked on uh, working with the community in general to gather feedback to understand that the different container runtimes were working well and making sure that you know, Seeker v2 was going to be adopted in the broader community as part of this effort. So a couple things about as you, a couple things to be aware of as you start to migrate with Seagrew v2 in Kubernetes. One of the things that you should do is probably just use one of the latest Linux distros that enables Seagrew v2 by default. Um, Rinal had that slide earlier. Had basically every distro these days is kind of defaulting to Seagrew v2. You also want to have a requirement that you need the kernel to be 5.8 plus. Uh, most of those kernels are already in even even newer versions. You should use an up-to-date CRI runtime. Uh, the latest CRI runtimes, Containerd, Cryo, they both support Seagrew v2. The other big thing I mentioned earlier, make sure you're using the systemd cgroup driver on both the Kubelin container runtime. That's some configuration you need to set. And SIGNode really doesn't support using the cgroup FS driver. That was commonly used on cgroup v1. We don't support it, and we don't actually test it. So please, just don't use it. Uh, and then also for hosted Kubernetes offerings, you know, if you're using a hosted Kubernetes offering like GKE, AKS, EKS, one of those, you should work with your vendor to understand how they're adopting cgroup v2. And you can chat with me about how GKE is doing that. So the other thing that you should be aware of is, you know, this is a big change, right? And so you should test your apps and make sure they work well with Seagrew v2. From kind of the work that we did, most applications, they don't really have Seagrew dependencies. It's quite kind of rare, but some applications do. And so the most common case is like third-party third monitoring and security agents. Those often have to go in and actually scrape the Seagrew file system and, and do things like collect metrics and other kind of low-level things. And those uh, might have dependency on Cgroups. And because the Cgroup v2 kind of API has changed due to the unified hierarchy and some of the other things, they need to be upgraded. And so a lot of those vendors already kind of have versions that support Cgroup v2, but you have to make sure that you're using those versions that are supported. So work with your vendor to understand what, what uh, versions have Cgroup v2 support and make sure you're using those versions. A couple other things, some of the popular projects like C-Advisor, uh, if you're running it as a standalone daemon set, you should upgrade to ensure it supports Cgroup v2. Um, the version there is listed. There's another project uh, that's kind of popular called Auto uh, Max Prox by Uber. Uh, this one kind of automatically, if you're using Go, it sets the Max Prox variable depending on the Cgroup setting. Uh, so that one is also upgraded to support Cgroup v2 in that version. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is some kind of language runtimes also depend on Cgroup. So Java actually uses the JDK, and when the JDK starts up, it actually looks at the Cgroup file system to understand how much CPU is available, how much memory is available. And so it uses Cgroups for that. And so uh, if you're using Java, you should make sure to upgrade to 11.0.16 and JDK 15 plus. They backported the Cgroup v2 support. And so using those versions will ensure that uh, Java applications will, will work well too. So that's kind of the idea behind Seagrew v2. Um, hopefully, once you adopt it, you'll kind of get a lot of those new improvements and kind of the lower level accounting and resource management that we mentioned earlier. And hopefully, your applications will work fine. That's kind of the goal, right? You won't see too many big changes. But the really cool thing about Seagrew v2 is some of the opportunities that it'll provide on top. And we have many opportunities to kind of improve resource management in general using Seagrew v2. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So one of the opportunities that we have is to improve kind of how we manage memory. And so this is actually a feature that's already alpha in Kubernetes. It relies on Seagrew v2. It's called memory QoS, uh, memory quality of service. So going back with Seagrew v1, the problem is with the kernel, we really only had one knob for memory. And that was memory limit, right? You hit the memory limit, and then you're oomed, and that's the end of the story. But with Seagrew v2, we have, much more we have much more kind of control over memory. We have four knobs, actually, min, low, high, and max. And these are the soft memory limits. So in the bottom right here, we have a little diagram to explain how it works. But basically, memory.min is kind of the guarantee of the kernel, please never reclaim this amount of memory. I, this is the minimum amount of memory I need. Memory.low is kind of best effort. If there's significant memory pressure, the kernel will try to reclaim it, but it usually will, will try not to. Memory.high is kind of the limit, but it's not the hard limit. So as soon as you hit that, your application will be throttled. It'll start to reclaim memory, but you won't be oom killed. And then memory.max is just like the limit we were talking about earlier, which if you go over that limit, then you get oom killed. And so the idea here is actually we are already setting in your pod spec, right? Everyone's setting a memory request, but we're not actually using it at all for C groups at all, right? We're not actually using this number. So the idea here is let's map the memory request to memory.low. And this will ensure that you have some amount of me minimum memory uh, for your application. The other idea is you're setting a memory limit, and we kind of want to get the guarantee that as you approach your memory limit, you'll start to get throttled and not oom killed and set something to memory.high. So the way we did that is we take your memory limit and we multiply it by a throttling factor. Uh, the default's kind of 0 0.8, and then we set that to memory.high. And the idea is that as you approach your memory limit, you'll start to get throttled because you'll hit memory.high, and then you'll, you'll kind of, the kernel will try to reclaim memory, and if you continue to get to increase memory usage, then you'll hit memory.max and you'll get oom killed. So the result here is hopefully you'll get less frequent ooms and kind of better performance as you approach the memory limit. <clears throat> 
Some of the other work we wanted to mention is uh, PSI pressure metrics. So this stuff is kind of coming down the pipe and we want to integrate Kubelet with it. This will allow us to kind of understand what resource shortages we have and improve the eviction. So we can detect things like resource shortages for CPU, memory, and IO, and this will improve uh, node stability. The other thing we want to talk about uh, is disk throttling. So, so uh, the Kubelet has really good resource control for CPU and memory and ephemeral storage, but disk has really been a resource that we haven't accounted for, disk IO specifically. So Seagrave V2 has a new I.O. controller that helps manage I.O. And we want ability to limit I.O. of pods so we can ensure that pods also get kind of uh, some amount of I.O. guarantees and can impact the node. The last thing we want to talk about is UMD. So Systemd has this kind of new concept called UMD, which is a user space UM killer. Uh, it uses PSI metrics for this. So the way it works right now is the kubelet sets a UM score, and then the kernel actually does the UM killing. But the kernel has really little visibility into the pods that are running. It has no idea about Kubernetes, pod priority, you know, what pods are, anything like that, right? But if we can move this um killing into user space, the Kubelet can make these decisions. And Kubelet's a lot better informed around taking into account things like pod QS, pod priority, et cetera. So we want to take the um killing and move it out of the kernel and put it inside Kubelet uh, and ensure that Kubelet can do that um killing where it has a lot more information it can deal with. And PSI metrics will help with that. So that's some of the future work that we're planning to do, and please join us kind of in Signode if you're interested in any of these areas. Uh, so I want to do a quick kind of demo video here around Seagroove 2 and some of those kind of concepts I, I covered. So uh, let me kind of make this full screen here. So the first thing we're going to do here is to create a cluster with Seagroove 2 uh, I'm using a cluster on GKE, and GKE has a feature called node config that you can specify that you want a cluster with Seagroove 2 enabled. So here we're specifying we want Seagroove 2 enabled, we're going to go ahead and create a cluster. This is a 125 cluster on, on GK with that node config. So we can see we have the cluster created here. Uh, the next step is we're going to have a little workload. Uh, well, first, we're going to ex examine the nodes that we have. So I just created a one node cluster. Uh, this is using the latest kind of 125 build um, of Kubernetes. It's using the container optimized OS, which we use on, on GKE. Um, it's running container D, and it's on the 515 kernel. So, this is kind of the, the latest uh, cost version here. So the next step is we're going to deploy a workload. So I just have a very simple kind of busy box workload. Uh, it doesn't do anything. It just does a sleep. Um, and the important thing is I'm specifying requests and limits uh, for CPU and memory. And I'm, the, the limits are higher than the request. So this is going to be a burstable pod. So I just take this pod, and I'm going to deploy it here on my cluster. So just your standard, standard uh, kubectl apply. Cool. And then I'm going to do get pods and, and see it's running. So cool, the pod's running. So the next step is I'm going to SSH into the node to kind of examine what's going on and, and what's going on in the actual node. So I'm just going to SSH into the node here. All right, so we're on the node. So the first thing I want to do is I ran this command called uh, stat, uh, and you can pass in the cgroupfs. And you can see here that we get back cgroup2fs. This is the way to check that the node is actually using cgroup2. So cgroup2 is being used on this node as we specified. Uh, the next thing I want to do is kind of show how the kubelet pod secret hierarchy is set up. So I'm going to run kind of the tree command on the kubelet a kube pod slice. And you can see kind of how kubelet's managing the different C groups. So at the top level, we have the pod slice. And so the way it works, right, is we're using the systemd C group driver. So systemd has slices, and then uh, systemd is creating the C groups underneath here. And so we have at the top level a best effort slice, versatile slice, and guaranteed slice. These are the different QoS classes. And within each kind of QoS class, we have a slice for the pod C group, right? Each of these are, are the pod C groups that we're seeing here. So that's the idea here. Uh, we're going to go one level deeper uh, just to see what's inside actually the pod C groups. And here, uh, within each pod C group, we have a dot scope unit. This is, a C group, this is the C group that's created by the container runtime for the actual container. So each container gets its C group created underneath that pod uh, level C group. And that's what we see here. So each, you might have you know, one C group basically for each container. And so because we're using the systemd C group driver, we can actually ask systemd about this type of stuff as well. So if we ask systemd, hey, give us all the slices that exist, systemd slice is basically analogous to a C group. Uh, then we can see here, uh, systemd is telling us, OK, here's all the slices on the system. These are all the pod C groups that created, that, that Kubla created. So we can see all those. And we can also ask systemd, hey, give us all the scope units. Scope units will be created by the container runtime for each container. Um, and then you can see them here. So if we do list units type scope, you can see here, these are, I'm using container D here, so we have a scope units for every single container. 
The next thing is, you know, we deployed that BusyBox sleep workload earlier, so I just want to kind of see how the C group settings are set up. So first thing, I'm going to kind of grab, uh, just run PS and get the PID uh, that the sleep command is running under. So, you know, here's the, the PID. And then I'm going to use procfs to actually see, hey, what uh, C group is this processing? So here's the full path, and it ends with dot .scope. That's the container C group, right? So I'm going to save this into a uh, environment variable just called the container C group, just so I can kind of uh, play with it, and it's a long path. So anyways, I, I have it here, and now we're going to see how the actual uh, resource settings are set. So we're going to take a look, look at CPU. So the first thing is a CPU wait. This is your CPU request. And you can see they're uh, set here. So these will be converted from the CPU request you set in your pod spec. And then also there's a CPU max, right? And that's the CFS quota and period that's set for, by the CPU limit. So all those settings are being set by the container runtime here. And then um, that's CPU. And so for memory here, I also want to kind of demonstrate how this is set up. And so I also enabled that memory QoS feature I mentioned earlier that sets soft memory limits. So we have memory.max set. That's set to the hard memory limit on the container, right? That's just like before. But we also have the soft memory limit set now, right? We have memory.high set. This is uh, computed earlier, right? As the throttling factor times the memory max. This is as you approach the memory limit. And then we also have uh, memory.min set. Uh, this is coming from your, CPU, uh, from your memory request that you have. So we're actually setting a soft memory limit uh, here as well. So that's kind of the idea here, just to kind of give you an idea of how C groups are actually working on the real node. Cool. All right. So that's kind of our presentation. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who worked on this. This is a kind of big effort in SIGNode, so big shout out and thank you to everyone in SIGNode who helped, helped work on this. I want to thank the container runtime community. Container runtimes are super critical here, and shout out to Giuseppe who worked on this uh, early on and really kind of pioneered a lot of the early Sigrub v2 work across the container runtime space. Uh, the container D maintainers, the cryo maintainers, and Moby Docker uh, helped a lot here to kind of start Sigrub v2 support. Uh, system D is kind of a critical element of C Groovy 2 as well, so thanks to the System D maintainers uh, for adding C Groovy 2 support and kind of continuously iterating on it. And of course, it wouldn't be possible without the Linux kernel uh, adding C Groovy 2 and, and all the work that went into C Groovy 2 in general. Um, we have a couple of resources here. We GA'd C Groovy 2 in 125, so there's a blog post there uh, that you can read to get more information. There's some Kubernetes uh, docs that you can read uh, about C groups and, and some of the details of C group drivers and so forth. And if you're more interested, uh, there's the kernel docs that are a great resource, as well as a couple other KubeCon talks. There was another KubeCon talk earlier this week about C Groovy 2, um, and then there's another talk from 2020 by Giuseppe that also goes into more details about C Groovy 2. That's a good resource. Uh, so with that, thank you for coming to our presentation, and really hope you can start using Seagroovy 2, and please let us know any feedback. Thank you. Um, with that soft memory limit, is there any way for something like a Java garbage collector to react to that, or like get a push notification? Like, what, what, what is the action that a programming language can take to help mitigate that so that you don't end up hitting that hard limit? So, yeah, so actually in C group system, right, there's a file that you can listen on and get events as you're crossing these thresholds. So maybe like the application can uh, open an FD on that file and look for this notification and react dynamically. But I'm not aware of any language doing that right now. But that's a great thing to explore. Yeah, the, the language could, could integrate with that. Yeah. And right now, the main thing that you'll get is the kernel will actually reclaim the memory from the JDK or from the application, right? And then hopefully the JDK is, is yeah. aware of that and will react appropriately. Yeah, so right now it's more a static tuning. It looks at the values and decides what the GC values are. But what you're talking about is like more dynamic. As you're using, how, how do I react when I'm getting this notification from the kernel that you were throttled because you crossed the low or min or uh, nearing the high. Hey, you talked about uh, disk I.O. What about network I.O.? Yeah, that's also definitely an interesting area. I think it's still pr pretty early, but I think we also want to uh, isolate network I.O. There's been some work in the community around that, and I think that's definitely an area we want to explore as well. I think Kubernetes is really good for support for CPU and memory, right, and some of the other resources uh, we definitely need to improve on. So that's something that now we want to explore for sure. Yeah, and on the, on the networking side, the details have changed a bit. So with V2, I think the expectation is you attach an eBPF program and then look for the C groups associated with it and then do the throttling. So it also depend upon your SDN plugin providers and so on on how to do that. 
Yeah. And, and all, the, all the network TCP socket memory will be actually accounted for under the kind of main memory counter in Seeger v2. So the memory is accounted there, but uh, for, for actually the network you know, usage itself, that's something that we still need to add. Um, so I might have missed this conversation in uh, Signode, but um, I know a lot of the stakeholders in Signode, like Google and Red Hat, use Systemd like heavily. Um, and so you mentioned that Systemd, you know, everyone was really pushing for Systemd C group driver. What is this? Is, does there exist a story for distributions that don't ship sh Systemd? I think for those distributions, right? Like. We see that majority of the distributions are using systemd. We don't see as much usage. That's why we concentrated on like keeping things simple. But if folks are really interested in using cgroupfs, like we really encourage them to show up to Signode, like raise their hands and help uh, get that support like fully baked and working. Yeah. I have a question about the soft memory limits. You mentioned before, if an application exceeds the soft memory limits, then you can throttle it down. Can you elaborate about what kind of applications you're targeting with that? I mean, if you're not scheduling it, then it's not going to release the memory. So in, in what situation that is, is that best avoided or best used? So what one idea it can do is kind of, if you're not using some of my mem memory, it's flush it to disk, right? And so that also interacts with swap, which is also an ongoing effort. So it tries to swap memory if it can. Some memory can be reclaimed by the kernel, right? Because it's shared and it's kind of caching it. So those are the kind of things that it tries to do. Yeah, yeah, the executable file pages can be swapped even though swap is not enabled. But there's also an effort to make swap available and then uh, it will work better. And also, like for UMD integration, will need swap. So UMD has the time to react to these changes and actually make decisions. Otherwise, if, if things are going too fast without swap, then you'll end up getting UMD killed by the kernel UMD killer. Uh, so incredibly exciting. Um, over here. Uh, I, I, I noted that uh, COS M97 should have C group 2 by default. We noticed in some situations where you're running, say, uh, two pods in a COS environment, uh, memory pressure against one can suffocate another. Uh, I'm guessing this, uh, this being enabled might help in a situation. Yeah, so I mean, if you're setting a, uh, it kind of also depends on the QS class that you're using, right? So if it's a burstable pod, uh, the, there is no, there might not be necessarily memory limit set, right? Or it might be at the kind of kubelet top level C group that's set. So depending on that, that's when uh, memory pressure can impact two different pods, right? Uh, but if you do set kind of guaranteed pod or you set a memory limit, then you should kind of get full isolation between the, the memory usage between two pods, right? And of course, memory, the QS feature will help kind of with soft memory limits as well with that. Uh, yeah, question here. So I remember that um, if you have a single-threaded app like Python where it can only take advantage of one CPU anyways, with C groups v1, if, uh, if I don't have a limit, the nature of the application automatically limits it to one CPU. But if I add a limit of, uh, hey, limit yourself to one CPU, just the act of adding a limit period can lower performance. And I was wondering if like C group v2 helps that scenario. So that's kind of dependent on, on the, you know, on the, on the Python interpreter to kind of do that. So if it always, it kind of depends if it's heading, hitting that CPU limit in the first place. So I don't know if Python actually you can configure and tell it kind of, uh, you know, like JDK and, and, and with Go max props where you can set kind of a, a CPU that, that you have that it can allocate underneath for you. Um, but basically, you know, if you set a CPU limit of one and it actually always will use less than, than one, then you, you shouldn't get throttled in the first place, right? But if you're setting a lower CPU limit and it's always using more CPU than that, then you'll get throttled. So Seeker V2 will not necessarily help with that unless uh, the, the interpreter will actually integrate with that and read those values and kind of tune itself appropriately. And that's not really C-group, yeah, it's like C-group V1, C-group V2, it's, it's uh, kind of general C-group uh, setting, yeah. Hi, appreciate for your sharing. So uh, in your slide there, you mentioned there is a configuration, there's a um, fat, fat, fatter configuration convert uh, memory uh, mass to memory high, right? So but that one is a global configuration. So do you consider may it uh, support uh, per, per port configuration? Means, uh, okay, if I don't set this for, for my port, uh, in my port spec, uh, 
uh, I will evolve back to use the global configuration. But if I already say in my postback, I will prefer this very, yeah. Why I ask this reason is actually it caused out an incident happening in our production when we uh, low out, low out SQL V2 because some uh, application actually for default case is, is, is okay, but some, some application they won't, don't want to be throttled, yeah, because they may very latency sensitive. And when we lower actually those, those application, uh, latency become very high. And turns out we figure out, we actually we take at least one hour to figure out this is uh, caused by our SQL V2, because at the beginning, uh, we didn't see this issue when we log out the SQL V2 to at least uh, one or two clusters. Yeah, so gotcha. that's the reason why I asked this question. So are, are you mostly focused on, on memory kind of then? Like if the, the, the pod is not setting memory requests and limits, that's kind of your question? Or more on the CPU side, that's, I didn't fully understand. Both, okay. So with the memory, so I'll talk about memory. So for memory, uh, with the memory QS feature, the one thing I didn't mention actually, it's not just setting the memory uh, min and uh, you know, memory high settings on the pod level. It actually also sets it at the higher level, at the QS level as well. Um, so it'll also kind of look at node allocatable and set memory settings there. So that'll ensure that even if you're not setting any kind of memory uh, requests or limits, uh, if you approach node allocatable, you'll also kind of getting that behavior at the top, top level C group. Uh, for CPU, I don't think we set it at any kind of top level. We set CPU shares uh, based on node allocatable at the top level. So that will ensure that, you know, we, if the, there's some amount of CPU available in the system, like all the pods share those CPU shares, right, at the top level. Um, but we don't set any CPU limit settings at the, at the top level. Does that help answer your question at all, or maybe I didn't fully get it? So I have a question that's a bit related. Uh, the you mentioned a 0.8 uh, throttling factor. Is that configurable in like the pod spec or at the node level, or is it like hard coded? Um, how would you go about configuring that? So I don't believe that's it. currently configurable. The feature's still in alpha, actually. Okay. So this is actually where it would be awesome to get your feedback and try it out and see if that works for you. I think that was kind of an estimation that we kind of said works for most folks, because we didn't want to ask people, hey, also set us a memory high on the pod spec. It's kind of like additional info we don't think is super useful. But if that is useful to be configurable, that would be great feedback. Is, is it possible to set which cores on the CPU are being used? Uh, are, are you asking, uh, we can request which cores can be? Well, we have a use case where we want different NUMA nodes to be used. We don't want workloads to be scheduled on the same NUMA node. And so we're specifying cores 1, 3, 5 to be used for certain pods. Is that possible to be set with C group V2 via a pod spec? So like it's C groups V2 also has CPU sets similar to right. V1. Yeah. And that should work similarly. Can you set it through a pod spec? N no, you can't specify which CPUs you want to use in the pod spec. Okay. You can only specify the number of CPUs, and then CPU manager or something else will go and container, work with the container runtime to actually pick the specific CPUs that your pod ends up using. OK. Thank you for this. I'm curious about the uh, UMD uh, killer in user space. Uh, would it be, is it possible to, I would love it if um, the monitoring has a lower priority for being UMD killed, like the monitoring namespace. So my user, uh, my other workloads uh, would have a higher probability of being UMD killed when my monitoring is kept up all the time. Do you know if that's uh, something you're considering? I, I think that's, that's what we are hoping, right? Like, when we use to an OOMD-like model, we can actually look at the priority set for your pod or other signals like the QoS class and make smarter decisions than the kernel OOM killer takes today. So that's our goal. And, like, we, we still have to do all that work. So you're happy to, like, join Signode and, you know, uh, give input on your use cases. All right, folks, we are way over time, so maybe we can take one last question. Yeah. We have time. Um, yeah, I've noticed that um, the burstability of CPU 
seems to have an effect on the um kill score. So if I had my request and limit for my memory set equal, I would kind of expect the quality of service for the memory aspect and the um kill score to reflect that of guaranteed. Um, do you know if that's being addressed at all in um, V2? Um, and do you know why that it behaves like that today? Yeah, so uh, you're completely correct. So when you have a burstable pod, we actually look at kind of the ratio between the memory requests and memory limits, and then that's how we compute the OOM score that will be set on, on the pod and in, in the containers. So, I mean, it looks at the memory, not, not at the, right, so it looks at the memory kind of request and, and limits ratio, because the idea is we want to have a different OOM score for burstable pods compared to guaranteed pods. If I don't set the CPU limit equal to the request, then I get an unexpected OOM okay. kill score. So well, let's, let's try about that. That's okay. pretty, very possible bug, so <laughs> might need to investigate it, yeah. Cool. That's it. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any further questions, please come up. Thank, thank you all. Thanks for the question.